Welcome to Southern Sense Talk Radio with your host, the radio chick, Annie Ubellis. Join Annie on Tuesdays and Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with an open chat room full of her regulars. And yes, you can even call in. Call 917-889-3675. That's 917-889-3675 to be a part of the action on the phone line. Not able to listen live? Not a problem. You can always catch Annie, the radio chick, and Southern Sense Talk Radio podcast in archives at southern-sense.com. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Southern Sense the right way. And right is that, and you are in the right place. You are listening to Southern Sense with your host, Anna Ubellis, who is not here today. You know where she is. She is attending the inauguration of Donald J. Trump, the 45th President of the United States of America, which means that you're stuck with um, me. I'm Cal Fritzy of RFB and IAW Radio. You know, the thing is, is that this is a very momentous day. I am so thrilled for my American brothers and sisters in inaugurating Donald J. Trump. And we are going to have quite a bit of discussion with that. We're also very excited that Ron Edwards will be joining us a little later on. You know what, though? I was watching the inauguration uh, today, and I was so full of pride. As uh, you may or may not know, I hail from Canada. I had tears in my eyes, though, all the same, because I knew as soon as Donald Trump placed his hand on the Bible and swore his oath, I knew that things changed almost immediately. It was magical. You could feel it crackling in the air. You truly could. And it just seemed to resonate with everybody in that there is indeed going to be true change in that great country. I am proud of my American brothers and sisters for doing the right thing and restoring sanity in the White House. I have a few observations I'll share with you, uh, Curtis and um, Ron and I will be uh, uh, talking back and forth. We will have a lot to share. And I think I have Curtis here. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hi, Curtis. How are you, dear man? How are you feeling today? Hey. I feel great now that uh, I'm, I'm on mic. My mic was off. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> What a moment, momentous day in the United States yeah, today. It was. it was, and um, I'm I'm happy for America, and I'm happy and delighted about our you know prospects for the future. I am too, and I was I was just saying that when I was watching uh, uh, Donald uh, uh, Trump take his um, oath of office, I could just feel like a crackling in the air. It just seemed almost immediate that America was almost immediately on her way back on track. It was just such a wondrous feeling. Well, that's, that's true. He uh, he didn't really give praise to, to his predecessor, and and he sounded like he meant business, and I'm, I'm convinced he does really mean business, and uh, things are going to change in America and on the you know, world scene and how the world perceives us and how we perceive ourselves. Did you see um, his acceptance speech when he was talking about the uh, 
corruption that he was going to uh, um, slice out within the Oval Office. And then the camera panned to uh, Barack Hussein Obama, and he looked really (laughs) stone-faced. He looked really as stone-faced as Michelle. (laughs) He looked like he was ready to go in cardiac arrest, the the way he grimaced, you know. I really felt kind of sad for the guy because, um, (laughs) indeed, he was a failure, and I'm glad he was, you know, with his agenda that is – it's a new day that's dawned upon America, and I think we'll go forward now. Oh, absolutely. And we are going to have a lot to discuss, uh, folks, about that. But before we do that, Annie always has her dedication. And, uh, Curtis, whenever you're ready to um, recite Annie's dedication, I will be more than happy to uh, listen to um, your words okay. and Annie's words, and this is for Matthew V. Thompson, isn't it? Yep, as our regular listen- listeners know, we always do a dedication for our fallen military, law enforcement, and first responders. Today's dedication goes out to Staff Sergeant Matthew V. Thompson. Matthew died August 23rd. 2016, serving in Operation Freedom Sentinel. Staff Sergeant Matthew V. Thompson of Irvine, California, died in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, of injuries caused by an improvised explosive device that detonated near his patrol while conducting dismounted operations. Thompson, who was 28, was assigned to 3rd Battalion, her Special Forces Group Airborne, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington. Thompson, 28 of Irvine, died of wounds after his unit was on, on patrol in Helmut Province. The Army said that um, his family lives near Milwaukee, where he graduated from high school in 2006. His wife, Rachel Thompson, told WTMJ-TV, that she and her husband met at Concordia University in Irvine, California, and married five years ago. She said she talked to him that Sunday night and knew that he was about to go on a dangerous mission. Thompson said her husband told her he loved her and that everything would be okay. The attack occurred in Lashkar Ga, the capital of Helmand Province which had experienced growing violence in the weeks before as research and Taliban forces reclaimed large swaths of territory previously secured by U.S. Person, personnel. One Afghan official recently said the district was on the verge of being overrun. On behalf of the men and women of U.S. Central Command, I extend our sincere condolences to the family, friends, and Sergeant Thompson's fellow service members, as well as gratitude for his selfless and honorable service to our nation, Army General Joseph Fultal, U.S. Central Command commander, said in a statement, the IED, which is improvised explosive device, also wounded another U.S. soldier, as well as six Afghan troops. Thompson was the second U.S. command and combat death in Afghanistan that year. An Army Green Beret, Sergeant First Class Matthew McClintock, was killed in Helmand in January 2016. Today we honor and send our prayers out to Sergeant Thompson's families and friends. May he rest in peace forever. God bless America, our fallen warriors, and all lovers of freedom. Thank you. for this long 
great day, America. The fact that, hey, a new day has dawned, and man, look out. Yeah. yeah. But I'm looking I'm forward telling to. You. Uh, I am so happy. I, I, I'm floating on air. And uh, the gentleman, <laughs> I'm not afraid to tell you that I want to pop the champagne cork right now, but I'm going to wait until 6 p.m. when my party arrives. <laughs> well, all right. <clears throat> yeah, well, there's going to be continued celebrations all week, all weekend. And the thing is, I enjoyed, I enjoyed his speech. I looked at uh, some of the uh, Dragon Media, and already they're calling him divisive. And I would think that uh, anyone that talks about strengthening America itself, uh, protecting our borders, um, <clears throat> revving up the economy, how is that divisive? We should be all in agreement as Americans on those particular issues. But we've been so ideologically stupefied in some circles of our republic that <clears throat> you've got people that are so brainwashed or brain damaged that they actually believe that speaking of strengthening the, the economy and strengthening our borders is tantamount to racism, uh, xenophobia, and some of the other horrible, silly terms that I've heard uh, even throughout the campaign. I, I just, I just marvel at the rancor and the stupidity that is so prevalent uh, around. I guess around through about almost fifty percent of the population that just goes along with this stuff. But through it all and besides it all, we, the Republic of the United States of America, is still going to be great again. We're still going to rise above the stupidity. And uh, those that don't like it, I mean, they're just going to have to live with it. It's going to be a great eight years, and I believe that uh, you won't hear this anywhere else yet. But I think Mike Pence will be our next president after Donald Trump has finished with two successful terms. Yeah, Do you I'm know that, that Mike Pence is the same age as me? Give wow. or take by two years. Yeah. Wow, okay. So he's got many years <laughs> left and he's gonna be doing great. Many years Excellent. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And he's been a great governor. He's uh, you know, just as governor one state over <clears throat> and since moving to Michigan and when he was governor, I just marveled at the difference at how the Indiana economy was doing as opposed to the Michigan economy where I'm at on in this fly paper here, just trying to get back out of here as fast as possible. But, uh, whew. and even Ohio to a lesser degree, uh, you can tell the difference in the economy compared to the way things have been run in Michigan. But, uh, Indiana has done phenomenally well. Uh, the city of Indianapolis, uh, very beautiful. And, uh, very prosperous state, and simply because Pence believed in lowering taxes and regulations and letting the businesses have their way, <clears throat> and so they could prosper and hire people. And, and what's most important, too, that I think is, is, is going to really turn this economy around is uh, the small businesses, entrepreneurs, and that's going to help our inner cities. Uh, you're going to see a resurgence, and even, believe it or not, this is going to be a miracle, uh, in cities like uh, Detroit, um, St. Louis, even the east side of Cleveland. And most of Cleveland has revived, but that east side, man, is just really abysmal. They call it the little Detroit there, and that you know particular east side section of Cleveland. But entrepreneurship uh, with small businesses, that's going to be the revival. Of our cities. Well, Absolutely. I like what he said about I like what he said about uh, all the gangbangers and drug dealers out there. All that stops today. So, uh, <laughs> from the sound of it, he's going to be directing some of his um, focus on solving our inner city um, gang violence and, and drug dealing, which is needed because. Um, as everybody knows, in Chicago, it's like a shooting gallery. It's like Lebanon back in the 80s. And we're never going to have um, true urban development in our inner cities when, you know, there's, there's violence of that level. You know, no no company in their right mind is going to move there and, and you know, hope to um, grow a business when, you know, you get shot. 
by teenagers at that, you know, who don't care about life. Well, I hate to say this, but our young folks have for two generations not been taught to care about life. You have an industry and, and, and a mentality of death, which came out of the abortion movement, which in my belief is spreads and furthers itself into the thinking of the, uh, the psyche of the community in which abortion was first foisted upon through Margaret Sanger and the, and the racist Democrats. And they just built upon that and built upon that. And if you don't care about the least of you, the most innocent, the most vulnerable, that is automatically going to spread further and further into uh, other aspects of life in that community. And like you said, I was listening to um, someone pro- played for me an overnight video uh, video of uh, Chicago, and it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because I, I really love Chicago. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling, the beautiful architecture there, just unbelievable. And the great uh, places, the venues you have there, and and all of that. But to hear, it would particularly in five districts <clears throat> overnight, the rat ta 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 ta. I mean, just continuous, and no sirens because it's like it's a no go zone. And in, in, like you said, uh, Curtis, in, in Lebanon, in the in the in the nineteen eighties, and it was horrendous. Just listening to it and heartbreaking just to hear. And see that in an American city to that level is just it's just mind boggling. It's just Americans killing Americans. And what's also heartbreaking is the same people will turn around and blame the white man or go to this bill if if one police officer kills kills an, a, 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 a a black person. And when the majority of the times when a police officer has shot person black or white. The majority of the times, those people were involved in criminal activity. Um, and true. even if, let's say, if a police officer does go to nuts, go you know, go off the rail, and you have a bad egg, and he shoots somebody that shouldn't be shot, that is still not an excuse to just burn down a Ferguson or a Baltimore or or whatever, because that's one person compared to, I mean, there are knights. In Chicago and here in Detroit, that you've got a dozen people shot, and yet these same people who run around and want to knock over Christmas trees on beautiful Michigan Avenue. I remember last Christmas, not this past one, but the, the Christmas before, knocking down Christmas trees on Michigan Avenue because someone was shot by a police officer, but nothing about the daily death rate in those same black neighborhoods. And that because yeah, that is because <clears throat> that there is a culture of death, and black people have been convinced by the progressives that you're not anything. You need help. You're a victim. Walla walla walla, which comes down to the point that you're not important. And if you don't think you're important, you're not going to think others are important. You can't love anyone any more than you love yourself. I mean, and, and so until black people are taught, especially the black males are convinced that they're somebody, you're going to continue to see the same thing. And I hate to say this, and this is, this is from the liberal side. This is not from the conservative side, but the liberals foisted an attitude all the way back to the 50s when you got that um, – or maybe before that, when they started handing out the welfare and telling the women – to get the man out of the house, and you can get a stipend from the government. What, what does that tell the, the, the man? That he's nothing. He's not needed. And while they did try that with other groups, not just blacks. I mean they like to make it look like they only tried it with blacks. But for some reason that I cannot figure out, I probably have to do some massive study. But for some reason it was the black female that in mass accepted that. And then that spawned. Just And it just grows and grows and grows. And so if you grow up thinking you're less than, you're not as important as the white man to his wife or the, 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 the Japanese man to his wife or whatever, and you start thinking you're nothing, you, you become bitter, and <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. And when you have babies, a bitter man having babies, what happens? 
it just gets worse and worse and worse. And then you become you, – you, you, you not only hate yourself, you hate those around you, you hate your country. And this is a built-in um, mechanism by the progressives. It was started by the progressives. They thought of this in the 1920s because they knew that they could not change America all at once at one time. So what do they do? They focused first on the black community. And now – well. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ralph. Well, and now those teachings that were in the uh, black schools in the 60s and 70s and are now in the white schools. I know this personally because <clears throat> my son has gone to – who has gone to the majority white schools all his life, and now that same anti-American – they're down on, on hateful towards – Towards the male in general And blaming males For all the problems in the world And, and the things that I see in their, in their books It is no wonder That if this is not stopped Thank God for Trump And all that it's going to The good that's going to come out of that There's going to have to be a change in education Because if In education this is not stopped What has happened In the black community will soon Happen in the white community And in fact a lot of wedlock baby births has now passed the never turn back rate of 30 percent because I remember reading that um, Hubert Humphrey warned that I think it was 66 or 68 or something like that. that once 30 percent is reached as far as abortions in the black community, that 30 percent breeds and it will go out of control. Well, that 30 percent threshold has now been reached in the white community along with the poisonous teachings that are now in the white schools. And that's how you destroy a nation, through the mind, through the young people. And I just, you know, through prayer and, 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 and other things and a great president that we're going to have, I believe this is all going to be stopped now. Yeah, I was going to uh, say that when I was growing up, we we believed in the American dream. You know, you... You get a good education, you find a good job, become a productive citizen, and a responsible citizen, and um, you just, you know, you want to go a little farther and invent something or open a business, you did that. But today's um, children, especially in the black community, they're, they are being led to believe that the American dream was never meant for them. And I, yeah. I see that as another way to keep, you know, keep them on the um, Democrat plantation because um, you don't feel like, you know, something is meant for you. You're not going to put up, you know, put in the effort to um, become a part of that. And what we have to do, and like you said, through our educational system, if we can get the, the, the left-wing, you know, agenda and propaganda out of our schools, we have to teach you know, reteach our children the benefits of, of living in a a constitutional republic. You know, I, I know they love to say we live in a democracy, but that's half the truth. If you're going to say democracy, you have to say constitutional, pure democracy of mob rule. And that's Absolutely. Not what we, have. we have a representative government. But we, we're going to have to teach kids that um, – their dreams are, are like everybody else's dreams here in America. You know, if you apply yourself and you go after it, you can succeed, you know. But these kids, like I said, they're not being taught that. And and the irony of it all is that blacks among anybody will fare better under Trump's policies because he's focused, you know, on bringing jobs back to the black community. He's focused on bringing down the crime rate and stopping the violence. But, see, they don't listen to that. They've been listening to their propaganda. They're not listening to what this man is saying. So, of course, they don't want to give him a chance because if he proves, you know, to, to, to turn out to be, you know, a successful president in that regard, then that's a battle that the left has won, another battle, you know, and, and that they don't want. That's true. That's that you, boy. You're spot on, sir. Um, I um, huh, 
that 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 puts the nail on it. But you know, I um also had to point a finger at the church. Um I I oh, grew yeah. up in a Christian in a Christian environment in, in Cleveland, but I did not come into a formal relationship with, with God and myself until I uh, moved to Michigan. And they say that, uh, you know, Detroit will drive you to Jesus or it'll drive you crazy. And it drew, drew, it, it drew me, you know, it drove me to Jesus because I said, oh, my God, because when I first saw Detroit, I'll be honest with you, it scared the bejesus out of me. Not because I was afraid of something happening to me, but I was afraid of what I could see happening to the rest of the country. Because, you know, one of the things that a lot of Michiganians love to brag about, uh, well, as Detroit goes, as Michigan goes, so goes the nation. Yeah, we're all that. And I said, oh, my God. And that was the city, in fact, that I had seen. I used to have (coughs) scare my friends when I was in high school. I had this vision that there would be this one city that represented Everything in the world that could go wrong with this republic, and it would be smashed up in this one city. The whole city would just be ugly, decrepit, and crime-ridden, and just just ugly. And when I moved to Detroit, um, that's what I saw. I said, "Oh my God! No wonder the, the, the civilized people—they—they—you they, 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 can't live in the city. This is for real." Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I had to get—I had to get out. I was basically put out. Because um, I only came there because I was in, uh, recruited by a couple of radio stations to do talk show work there, and and I was naive. I came to Detroit thinking it was like a, a little Chicago or something, because I knew the population was bigger than Cleveland, but in many ways Cleveland was a much bigger city because you know you, we still you know our our downtown is vibrant, our mu- museums are second to none, and our orchestra. The number one on, in on in, in America, you know, we still had some semblance of greatness in the city. But when I came to Detroit, I mean, everything B grade orchestra, the uh, Detroit in- Institute of Arts was even just like a step down. I was just so disappointed in the condition of everything. And I in Hudson's department store, I want that was the last big old department store in America that I had not seen. And I got here. It was gone. It was, there was a hole in the ground where Hudson's used to be. And I said, oh, my God. I said, man. I, in fact, I cried. I said, and I don't cry very often. I mean, goodness. Yeah. But I cried for the nation. It was like, and of course, the people that were with me, they were showing me the, the, the metropolitan area. They thought I had gone out of my mind. I said, you just don't understand. I said, I'll write it out in the column or I'll talk about it but on the on the air. But I just... And my mind was just jumbled, and, and it just – I said, what have you guys – what have you people wrought here? I said, because you all had uh, – between you, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh, that was the manufacturing floor of the world. And you let it go. You just let it go in just 50 years. And um, then when the Democrats took control of Detroit in the 1960s, Mayor Kavanaugh, and I said – well, they, you know, and I gave them a lot of the history, and I said, "Well, they were saying, well, how do you know all those details?" I said, "Well, it's called reading." And I remember they took me on a, a drive throughout the metropolitan area, and I said, "Man, there were particular areas that I really liked. They were very pretty." And I said, "Hmm, if I have to stay in Michigan for a while, this is one of the areas I want to stay." And one of the disc jockeys, oh well, yeah, one of the disc jockeys at the station. <coughs> Name was Sir Yocker, whatever that means. He turned to me. He said, "Literally, who in the hell do you think you are? What makes you think you can live in a, in an area like this?" Hmm. And I said, and I t- looked back at him, and I said, "This wasn't some white redneck. This is a black person." And I looked at him like he was totally out of his mind. I didn't know whether I should call the men in the white coats and get this boy some treatment. And I looked back at him. I said, well, what do you mean by who in the hell do I think I am? I already know who I am. I said, I'm an, I'm an American, and I happen to see an area that I like. And if there comes a time that I can afford to live here, if my money takes me there, if I'm stuck in Michigan, this will be one of the areas that I live here so I can tolerate the place. That's who I think I am. 
And, of course, he didn't like that answer, but then I made a bet with him. I said, normally I'm not even a betting man, but I will bet you that within five years you will still be stuck where you are, and I will be in one of those three areas in metropolitan Detroit if I'm here that I have said that I want to live in if I have to stay here. And we shook on it. He said, you black, you black. I said, and I said, well, what in the world does that have to do with it? I said, anyway, okay, we've made the bet. Let's do it. Yeah, this. when I shave in the morning, I, I see what I look like in the mirror. Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so anyway, I won the bet. I, I, am, I am in one of the areas that I had, had picked, one of the three areas that I wanted to live in. And I said, uh, and I have found that his career did go down, and he's not living too well because he maintained a bitter – crusty attitude and the and the thing is the man was a super talent the man was so talented that there used to be a station called cklw the big eight it was one of those legendary top 40 stations that america used to have across the country in chicago it was w cfl and wls in in new york it was wabc and cleveland wgar they, they were all over and the guy in CKLW was in Windsor, Ontario, and that was one of those super stations that reached 48 states in half of Canada, you know, at night. Big signal. Mm. And they gave, they wanted to give this man a super opportunity. He says, no. He turned it down. But yet he runs around saying how prejudiced the white man is. And I said, oh, you foolish Galatian. Do you, t- trust me. If those people, <laughs> if I had been here, and they said, well, Ron, we'd like you to uh, engage in our news department, and I would get to work with great news guys like Grant Hudson and Byron McGregor and all those superstars, man, I, if I had to crawl on my knees across the Ambassador Bridge to Windsor, I would have made it over there. I wouldn't have cared. It's about opportunity and growth, not staying in an anthill, a molehill, and complaining about the problems that, in your case, you allowed to fall in on your own life, in his case meaning. And for you to be bitter and tell me that I cannot live somewhere, that I can't follow my dream, is totally idiotic. And that is, as Curtis said, you know, it's, 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 it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that they, that they continue to speak over themselves – and I remember people telling me growing up in Cleveland, sure, I had my friends and, and people that were backing me, but there were a lot of people. Well, you, man, you better just go get that factory job over there. And I used to tell them, I said, by the way things are going and these stupid trade agreements, there won't be any factories. And boy, was I right. And so um, <clears throat> those people are to, to this day, if they're still alive, unemployed or underemployed, Bitter, old-looking, you know, because you know, or diseased because they're so bitter that their bodies are racked. Their bodies are either racked with disease or their minds are re- are racked with with stupidity. You know, take your pick. And the evidence is, you saw it. Um, I'm sure you all looked at the news. These people, we're getting ready to have a this morning. We're getting ready to have a great time with the installment of our our, our great president. And these people. Ran by a McDonald's there in D.C., broke the window, and what I was offended by more so than the the crime was that the police officers only chased them away like a parent, somebody chasing someone off their lawn. They just chased them away, sprayed a little tear gas, and let them get away. But I believe, as Curtis said, that that's going to be a change, and, and, and there needs to be. I don't know if you guys remember, but… Reading about Nixon, um, you know, they, they like to hate on that man, but he wasn't all bad. When he got into office, he said, no more of this madness to the demonstrating and the craziness in the streets. And he came down like a ton of bricks on the rioters. And do you know it stopped? He, he, brought, he brought that stuff to an end. And so – because I know during the convention and all that, I think it was if I if Curtis or, or uh, help me out if I'm wrong, but 
I think the 68 convention was in Chicago, and there were huge riots, and it was just crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's when, and Nixon um, said, enough of that, and he put an end yeah, to it. Yeah, that's when, when he got in office. When Paul Vardell had their great debates on the 68, um, Republican and Democratic. I mean, they had it over a couple of days, and there were riots and stuff in Chicago. Yeah, it was bad. I remember that. You know, I, I was just a little, little, little kid. But I do remember my parents talking about the um, 68 convention, national convention, and that was at the amphitheater, wasn't it, in Chicago? Yeah. And uh, I'd never seen um, anything like it. As I uh, uh, grew older, I would go back into the archives, and I think that I have been paying more attention to this in light of what we're seeing with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And so I have been going back in archives, and I, I'm just appalled. Oh, yeah. I, I remember, because I was, I was a little boy growing up in the 60s, but I remembered stuff. And I remember, you know, years later, my, my mom, got, the rest of soul, my dad passed when I was 12. But I remember my mom used to laugh with me later on, and she says, as a little tyke, I'm in elementary school begging my parents to vote for Nixon. And because I could just see, I, here I am not knowing <laughs> that much as a little child, but I was taught enough right and wrong by my parents and which was reflected, believe it or not, in, in the school that I went to, those Democrats, they just did not look from a child's perspective. Based on how I was even being reared in my home, listening and the little I could understand as a child, I just not did not – I remember telling my mom. I said, Mom. I remember because she would have me say my prayers every night before I go to bed. And that's when I would tell her, Mom, I, I tell, tell Dad, I, I, you guys should, should not vote for, for those Democrats. I don't know if you are. I, don't, I didn't even know if they did or didn't, but I remember telling them that. And I remember years later, they would, when I started getting involved in radio and I had a weekend talk show and stuff like that, and I'd come home or whatever, and she would tease me about them. She said, you know, you said those same things as a little boy that you were – you were against those Democrats and all that, and, you, she, and of course she admitted I was right. But um, you know, um, they're, they're just destructive, destructive minions. They they uh, have done no good in our republic. The only Democrat that has done any good <clears throat> on Earth um, is Kiss Kennedy. That's the only uh-huh. good one I can think of because simply because I read about how he lowered taxes. And he was anti-communist. Also, and this is why they plugged him his head full of uh, lead. He was against the Federal Reserve System. He spoke That's out true. against that. And um, and I know that Trump is not a fan of that system. He hasn't been as vocal, but he has spoken out in terms that are not glowing against the the, the um, what is it called the globalists. Elites or whatever, because yeah. she, that's what that's what that America First is about. That's why they, in the uh, in Dragon Media today, said that he's about. Uh, in fact, the um, oh God, what is the the position name of the person that heads up uh, Germany? It wasn't Merkel, but it was the under the person that's under her. Oh, the um, uh, prime minister, uh, Frederick. Yeah. I something like that, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> he lashed out against uh, today against Trump. Um, I thought Trump was a little silly about the car statement, but their main focus today was attacking Trump about you know being. Um, I can't I can't remember it verbatim, but meaning that basically he was silly for being putting America first, that he's being just overboard in, in that regard, and. To me, that's very evil for another a leader of a foreign country to say that because to not want the United States of America, the leader of the free world, and whether anyone on the planet wants to admit it or not, that is, is the better America is, the better the whole world is. And for them not 
to want an American president that wants to build up America and to make her as strong and as powerful as she can be, especially in the wake of a growing China influence, because as big and as powerful as China is now, she has not stabilized. She is not a stabilizing force in the world. She is not a blessing when she deals with um, um, leaders around the world. She is not a blessing economically, even in Africa. And I know that from a secondhand, um, from statements from people. In fact, a, a, a neighbor of mine who's from Ghana, and they go back and back to Ghana every summer, and they tell me that to, to quote them that dealing with China is a curse, dealing with America is is blessing. Um, and I have friends from Australia say the same thing, that China is coming on like a gangster. Well, you better come up. You better you better uh, uh, break your allegiance with the United States. We're the big dog now. Who's your daddy? And, and saying statements like that, and the way Obama allowed them to take over the, the the beautiful Fiji Islands and all of that, those were nothing but wonderful, friendly people in the Fiji Islands and throughout the that that area of the world. Friends of ours, by the way, and many of them are Christian, and they were just a wonderful, clean, wholesome people. That um, they weren't backwards or anything like that. They weren't um, like some areas of the world where people are just, you know, just bass backwards and, and, and have horrible living conditions. Um, but they weren't, a, 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 let's say, as modern as, let's say, the, J- the Japanese or whatever. They were just a decent, wonderful people. And the, the Chinese have moved in there. They've built a, an artificial military base in international waters. Only because the United States, under Barack Hussein Obama, withdrew our force and our influence, our God-ordained influence in the world. And And, uh, just to let uh, you know, gentlemen, that we do have a caller here. And Curtis, this is our caller, 2235. Do you want me to bring uh, him or her on right now? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. And welcome to the program, 2235. You're speaking with uh, both Curtis and uh, Ron. Uh, What's your question or comment for either one of the gentlemen? Oh, well, uh, the comment I I had was um, you guys have discussed conservative um, republic values um, as far as republics go, and I I just wanted to interject about the principles behind a republic that the, the original intent of the founding fathers for our government was to have it be a uh, a limited republic um, with the maximum role of the government being the protection of life, liberty, and property. Um, yep. And what I would like to, and most most people understand that, but what I would like to add, well, most conservatives understand that, because really liberals don't, but I'd like to add that that there, there's a good argument to be made that government by its very nature violates the citizens life liberty and property through taxation by taking taxes from them against their will um, if it was a voluntary donation it would be a, a, a donation or a charitable contribution uh, but you don't have a choice in paying your taxes it's it's coerced and if you resist then they, they violate your liberty by arresting you or putting you in jail or if you resist that it, eventually you get killed so um so I, I just I wanted to hear your thoughts on that, and um, thanks for taking my call. Oh, absolutely, and I don't want to call you caller. What's your name? I'm, I'm my apologies. Uh, Ryan. 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 Ryan, would you yes, like uh, Ron or Curtis to address that? Uh, either way, whoever whoever would rather take it. Um, can I? You mind if I take it? Absolutely, oh, okay, Ron. Okay, go right ahead. And I'll follow up. Well, first of all, <clears throat> Ryan. Thank you for your call, man. Uh, you, I, in my opinion, you're spot on. The nature of the government is, is as you said it. I cannot uh, say it any better than you have. And in fact, is the nature of this current setup of our government, as it is called a democracy now, which is incorrect. The nature of a democracy is, as you say, to to continue to grow and to take away the rights and to coerce taxation and things of that nature because a democracy has no respect of the individual rights and liberties of of we the people. It's basically a mobocracy. 
and which sacrifices the rights of the individual. Exactly. And also when you have this coercive means of taxation, the way it is set up also, it is set up to eventually collapse on itself. And what we should have, which is, is voluntary, is a sales tax, is a, is a type of a sales tax. Some people call it fair, and some people call it uh, something else. I can't think of the term right now. But – and it should be a percentage that is across the board. Let's say tax. I'll just uh, – what now? A uh, consumption or a usury tax? Maybe. Yes. Yeah, consumption. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's. I'll just throw a number out there, 10 percent. You know, God only asks for 10 percent. How dare the government take more than that? But – um, let's say if everything across the board is 10%. Now, um, a millionaire could buy a jet and pay a 10% tax. I go out and buy a car, pay 10% tax. And if that's all the taxation, that's all the taxation we need to be technically correct. Do you know that if we were to um, adopt such a, such a system, there would be no deficits? Especially not only coupled with that, if you place the money back into a, a tangible system of gold or, or something of that nature, which also would control uh, would cause a control of spending and force the government to maintain uh, within its limitations of, of, of financial responsibility. And as you said, if we got rid of um, – I mean let's say if we adopt such a tax, the IRS would die on its own weight. Because um, you wouldn't even have to announce, all right, we're going to get rid of the IRS because you would start such a hornet's nest of stupidity. But what would happen is that the IRS agents would have nothing to do. And as they retire, you wouldn't replace their positions and so on and so on. And in time, you could say, well, hey, the IRS is doing nothing. We can abolish it because there's no need for the IRS, which is basically another form of stealing more money. And more power from we the people. And so um, <laughs> this way of the current um, statute that we have as far as taxation is immoral, and it is constitutionally, in my opinion, illegal. It's, it's, it's unconstitutional. And I pray that, that Donald Trump recognizes that and that we will start working towards a more constitutionally limited form of government and uh, taxation. I would add to that that um, I believe we should go back to consumption tax, not only get tax on what we buy, what we purchase. I mean, that's the way it used to be before they had the payroll tax. You know, and I think more people would, you know, put into that than what's being taken now, because for one thing, we have people who don't work. That don't pay anything as far as taxes is concerned. But if we can get this economy, this engine that we have in this great nation going again, we'll have more jobs. And with more jobs, we have more people, you know, buying things. And they can get, you know, can get the taxes from um, the consumption, you know, that we purchase. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, Curtis. Spot on. Yeah, the concern we need to do. that I have, the concern that I have with that level of taxation is, is if if a little bit of taxation is okay at say ten percent, for an example, then why not twenty or thirty or forty or fifty, kind of like we have today, or at, at that rate, why not ninety or even a hundred percent? And I think there's that slippery slope that we've seen in the past two hundred and fifty years or so since 1776, that the, you know, the, the Constitution as it stands. Either was uh, I think it's a Lysander Spooner quote. Uh, it's either either enabled the government we have today, or was powerless to prevent it. Uh, right. So I don't. I don't right. think. Go ahead. I have an answer to that. I, I actually have an answer to that. Here in Oakland County, where I live in Michigan, there's a town called Rochester Hills, one of the most prosperous towns in America. What they did when it was founded in the 1950s was that they said, in our town, there will never, ever, ever, ever be an increase in taxes. They, the people voted on a particular level of taxation, which is very low. And do you know that to this day, they have been held to that particular level of taxation? When the, when the greedy hoarders in government try to come back and have 
have a, have a change, they have to go to the people. And since the 1950s, when Rochester Hill was was founded, there has never been an increase of taxes because of the people have the reins of that of that city. And guess what? That city is in a surplus and has always been in a surplus. But you know how the greedy government hoarders are. But the people have kept that in check. And I think that if we are blessed with a sales tax in America, all the people have to do is demand a ceiling and that in order for that ceiling to be changed, that it would have to be a decision made by the people, not the government. And that's how you that's how you eliminate the greedy hands of government. You put the authority in the hands of the of the people. It is about we the people. Not them the government hoarders. I would, um, I would certainly be happier with, say, for example, a 10% flat sales tax than what we have today, uh, for sure. It would be a much pro- more prosperous country. Um, yes. But, um, you know, even even then, like, um, say, 10% is a good example, um, I would be more than happy to donate 10% of my income to, uh, you know, to, to schools and to, uh, you know, maybe a defensive military force and uh, you know, welfare for those who, who really truly deserve it. Uh, the, the list goes on and on, uh, but I, I wouldn't ever want to force my neighbors to contribute 10%, uh, either personally or to the government, uh, to, to force anyone to, to fund anything. It's immoral to me. Uh, but isn't it? Even, even but, isn't, it's only 10%. but isn't the consumption tax voluntary because you dictate how much you you pay because? It is when you That's decide right. you want you want to go out and buy something, or can afford something. You go out and dictate how much you pay by how much you buy. That's right. You're not you're not paying a tax until you go out and decide on your own that you want to go and purchase something. So, I mean, the, the founding fathers had that in mind, and so there therefore, and like I said, the people vote on a limitation. So that the government cannot force an increase of the taxation on them. I mean, that, and we have a, like I said, we have a city here in Oakland County that has done that, and they are in the surplus, and they've got the best roads, they've got everything going for that city. And um, I mean, that's a very great step in the right direction. And um, <coughs> uh, Another fine example, I, I've said it, I think I said it the other day uh, on the broadcast, is that uh, we could eliminate poverty around the world in five years. All you have to do is you look around the world and you look at places like Singapore. I mean, their tax rates are just ridiculously low. And they don't have all these levels of taxation and goofiness like we have in the United States. They took what we had. And ran with it, and 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 did not get into the stupidity that we have. And Singapore is is very prosperous. It is so easy to to open and run a business there. And Hong Kong used to be that way, and to a degree, it still is. And you have a, a few other places around the world. And we have to get back to that to the in the United States of America. Um, we have to get rid of. In fact, I I think that. Uh, you know, they talk about these corporate taxes. You know, I understand that Mr. Trump wants to lower it to 15 percent or somebody said 20 percent. I said, oh, my God, that's not going to help. And mm. But I've said that we should always keep ours as the lowest on earth. And I, I, I Well, you are attracting business, it. too. And, personally, I'd get rid um, of it. I, 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 I do have a question it. for you, Ron, in particular, because um, you're so adept at this. We could eliminate a lot of taxes if we uh, stopped with the pork uh, projects. Uh, yeah, the finest example really that I have is uh, Sarah Absolutely. Palin. When uh, she was the uh, governor of Alaska, uh-huh. she was invited to uh, uh, bring, in, uh, bring in all these uh, pork projects like the uh, Bridge to Nowhere, and she said, no, I'm not doing that to my constituents. I'm not doing that to the people of Alaska. And she put that state right in the blue because she refused to play along with the tax grab. Yep, and that's what we have to do. 
That's what we have to do. And I'm going to give you guys a real example of, of, of just how evil government can be. Here in Detroit, uh, there's a, a bridge called the Ambassador Bridge. It just goes between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario. That beautiful uh. bridge was built by a private company, the Maroon Company. And uh, it's been successful for, I think it was built in the early 1900s or whatever. Beautiful structure. And the government has been trying, I know since I've moved to Michigan, to wrestle control of that bridge from the Maroon family. And Mr. Maroon, whom I've met, has been made by the local liberal demons in, in, in the media to look like he's an evil old crotchety um, um, the old crotchety character in, in a Christmas story, that kind of a guy. And so, and I'm thinking, Mr. Maroon is a nice guy. Why are they doing this to him? And so as I looked into Michigan politics and all of that, the greedy, evil government is trying to not only take control of that, because they don't believe that private citizens, we, the people, are not smart enough or don't deserve to own such such um uh, entities as a bridge. Who are we? And so they're about to build, embark upon a second bridge, which the Maroon family built. And by the way, when that br- bridge was built, it was built unlike most government-built bridges. Was built um, on time and under budget. Now they're planning another bridge, a superstructure. <coughs> this one could have been built by now. Would have already been built by the Maroon family. They had already gotten permission from Ontario. Everything was set to go, right? No tax dollars. Guess what happened? We had a governor. Her name was, I call her, Gimme Jenny Granholm. Ms. Granholm, their administration contacted the Windsor City Council and the the government of Ontario and said some bad things about Mr. uh, Mr. Maroon got them to change their mind says nope we're not going to permit you to, to 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 build a bridge to our to our to our to our province it just happened man bamo and because now they're going to build a bridge but guess what we the taxpayers it's going to be about a billion dollar bridge mr maroon was going to build one with his own money for about uh, 250 million something like that and it was going to be a beautiful structure this that and the other now, this government bridge is going to be beautiful, but if someone from the private sector could build a bridge and do a better job than the government, why should not the government – I mean, why should not the private citizen be allowed to do that? But the government and the liberal media made Mr. Maroon to be a bad guy and lied on him about ramps and all kinds of stuff. And labeled them, oh, they did the old trick, too. They were to label them a racist. Now, I know him personally. have had lunch with the man, and the man is nobody's racist. So here's another trick. And government does this stuff because they want control. And I understand about p- controlling the border and protecting the border. Well, if they were so concerned about controlling the border, they wouldn't be allowing under the, that administration and under even the current Republican administration in Michigan, they would not be allowing and sneaking in all these refugees from Somalia into, into communities throughout Oakland County and are trying to change the demographic nature and the voting patterns of our, of our, of our cities here in Oakland County. I, and so it's, it's <coughs> so evil what these progressives that have, progressives have been doing and by the way, this has been brought to uh, Trump's attention. I made sure that when Donald Trump was here, Jr., that he got a hold of this. I gave him that, that whole story in writing to give to his dad about the brutality of government in Michigan and how they just stomp on the people, Republican and Democrat, because these Republicans here are, 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 are rhinos. They're, they're just no good rhinos who, just like the Democrats, Stomp on the rights of the people, support Common Core, stupefying, further stupefying the, the children, the students, so that 
America, Michigan, whatever, can be brought into this corrupt globalist mentality. That's all they're pushing in these schools, globalism, globalism. America was, a, was built on slavery, this, that, and the other. That's all they're telling the students now, in, in, at least here in Michigan. And, 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 and so there's got to be a huge reversal, and I know it's going to happen now. But I'm just telling you, giving you just one little example. Oh, and and there, you, there's stuff like this all over the country about brutal government just being treating us, treating us like we're the enemy. Well, you know, Ron, there's a reason why children do not want to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance or, or sing the Star Spangled Banner. And it's because of what you were saying. Is teaching the children to think global. Nationalism is a bad word to them. You know, we're supposed to be um, members of the, the world, you know, the world body, and that's what they're teaching these kids. So, you know, we've got to reverse that trend. And as Trump said this morning, America first. And hopefully um, we can penetrate the uh, school system and, and root out all of this left-wing um, agenda and get some true American, you know, bread and butter stuff in there so we can have students who, who are patriots and um, who, who appreciate and love this country. You know. Hey, man, let me, let me ask you guys. I'd like both of you to, 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 to just say how do you believe – that we should approach the schools because they are so impacted. I've, I've gone to these PTA meetings, and I've even had the displeasure. It was sort of like undercover. Uh, there are a few conservative teachers in there, and um, I've gone to them to these teachers' conferences. And because they're so disorganized, I was brought in. They thought I was a, a teacher's assistant <laughs> And I'm sitting here just gleaning all this horrible information and I'm, and I'm really controlling myself so I don't blow up. And I'm listening to them giggle and about, and, and, and about how they're brainwashing the children and the games and, and things that they're bringing forth for the little elementary school. And what really got me going was when my son was in elementary school, this is uh, first grade. And we're looking at his little book, and I open it up. It was a pretty book, and that's what drew my attention because, you know, if it's something that's really artsy, I'm, I'm into to arts and things like that. I said, wow, this is a beautiful book. And I opened the book. My son brought it home, and I opened it up, and it says, Johnny's uh, – it's, it's two dads painted pushing a stroller together. Now, my son was only six years of age. And they're starting it that young. And, of course, I, it was my turn to go to Nutsville. And I go to the school, and I'm like, what in the hell are you doing? What in the hell are you doing? Why are you allowing this trash to be taught not only to my son but to any son or daughter in this community? What is this? Why are you such an enemy? And they're, like, looking at me like I'm – Cuckoo and cuckoo, and well, that's there's no harm in that. This is just part of the curriculum. And I said, wait a minute. If there was no harm in this, trust me, you all wouldn't be pushing this. You all have an agenda. Since you're not going to tell me, I'll tell you. You all have an evil agenda, and it's changing society, the mores of society, and you're starting with 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 someone with just children so young. And so um, I had a one of the teachers pulled me to the side and who was a, um, a closet conservative, and I had to get into her grill. I said, wait a minute. I said, I understand about, you know, <clears throat> your, your job and all of that, but there comes a time where, you know what, if we keep in this direction, there won't even be the, the wherewithal to maintain the school system. You all are grinding this nation into nothing. There will be no prosperity because you're so demoralizing our country on one hand, 
you're destroying the economy. You're pushing the destruction of our economy through your, the, your false economic premises that you're also giving to the children. So you all won't. You all will be on the on the on the lower end too. And I said, you all just continue to push, 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 and you smile in our faces at the PTA meetings and act like you and carry yourselves like you're, you're you're holier than thou and like we should bow down and bump our heads on rugs like we're bowing to like someone like an idiot bowing to Allah or something. Yeah, exactly. And they look well, at you me know, like I'm the, the enemy or something, like I'm wrong or evil for, for wanting to protect our students. So it's going to take so, some time, Rob. It's going to take some time because um, the left, they started way back in the early 1900s infiltrating our school system. I think we can do something at least at the government school level because um, when you look at the map, you have more Republican governors and and, and um, other positions at the state and local level that are, are Republican. And I think we can um, – we can pressure these these politicians to to make that change in our curriculum. It's going to be a little more difficult at the college level because you know a lot of colleges are private, but uh, and that's where most of them are indoctrinated. You know, to come out and and, and spew all this um, left leftist Marxist socialist stuff. But it could be done. It's going to take some time, but we just got to stay at it. Just got to stay at it. And just so yeah. you know, Curtis, that we have somebody else on the line um, joining the conversation, and that's Cool Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, everyone. How are we doing? Uh, it's great. Hey, Mike. Good. Great it's January. Great day in America. What a great day. Yeah, yes. and you know, I was going to mention, I'm in Grand Rapids, so when you were talking about Michigan, I, I feel you. I ran for the school board, and it's okay. uh, I can't imagine it's any different anywhere around the state. To whereas once you become a candidate, you really, really see exactly how uh, how the system is so corrupt, and it is deep, Curtis. You're right. Uh, it, it's it's layers and layers, and it's it is going to take time. But you know, I think today we saw a great start, where basically we have a president now who isn't afraid to insult the establishment. There is no <laughs> political correctness, and for the first time in God knows how long. He acknowledged radical Muslims. I, I, I mean, we don't too often see too many radical Catholics or Jews or Christians, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, blowing stuff up. I thought this was a good start. And, uh, you know, the TV kept showing the president to other people during his speech. Boy, they must have just been. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you're right, Mike. Hey, Mike. Yes. Are you still there? Yeah, you live on yeah, the right good here. side of the state. You, li- you live on the good side of the state. I love it over there, Holland and and all of that, and the Lake Michigan shore, the dunes, uh, over there where you guys live. Uh, I know Grand Rapids isn't right on the, the lake, but you know what I mean. When you go further west, there yeah. it's just such a, such a great well, area, Holland. Here's a, yeah, here's a perfect example of <clears throat> Grand Rapids and why I ran for the schools. Now we have about we have a pretty decent school system. It used to be the second biggest in the, the state, but an awful lot of people within our city now go uh, who live in the city uh, chosen different schools. But we, it's a primarily dominated minority district. Yet we have okay. seven schools dominated by almost all whites that are doing fine. But then you have the all black schools, and they're not. Seventy-four percent of our uh, black and Hispanic kids are illiterate in the third grade. They cannot read. This is the third or fourth year. Now, you tell me, okay, we know a lot of problems are at the home. We, we, I, I don't want to blame this all on the system. We know, we know uh, the reality of it. However, my point being is that these are totally in control by the limousine liberals, the ivory tower academics, and, the, the, you know, this is just horrible. They, uh, most of the schools today did not even allow time to watch the inauguration. Now, do you mean to tell me? I, I don't know this, okay? I'm guessing. But I'd be willing to guess four years ago the world stood still uh, in the school system during the inauguration. So, But, I mean, that just goes to show you 
And when I ran I, at the, t- at the t- uh, candidate forums, I called these people out. And when I told them, I said, you better get used to it. Donald Trump is going to be president. I said, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue to fight. And basically, one of the persons from the union, the teachers union, decided not to endorse me. But one of the panel members said, look, I'll be honest with you. The Democratic Party said, if you endorse Mike Farage, you will never get another dime from us. And that, this is how they do it. And, you know, I'm, this is just how they do it. And, uh, you know, Detroit, I mean, I mean, you just constantly, in our city, in our state, you were so right when you talked about it's Democrat or Republican because they voted 80 to 20 percent against the gas tax that the governor and the uh, progressives tried to push through. Eighty percent. I mean, you yep. never hear that high percent. Yet seven, yep. week, eight week, seven or eight weeks later, the, the Republican-led House and Senate passed the gas tax. Yep. I mean, it's just right in the face of we the people. And we're changing that, at least in the aspect of the Republican Party. We have the Trump director, Scott Hagerstrom, is running for state party. And, you know, we're going to hold these people's feet to the fire. Yes. That's good, because I, I, I know Scott. He's a good man, too. And uh, uh, he's he's going to be doing some great, some great things. And uh, there was a problem. It was a few years ago. Um, when I was on that, uh, Jim Chiodo had invited me out for a panel discussion, and <laughs> I ended up being asked by the mayor, I believe, of Holland to write a column about how Holland – and you talk about the government using special interest groups to as wedges to create disharmony in the community. Well, there's in recent years, I don't know if anyone knows about Holland, Michigan. Holland, Michigan is this beautiful, uh, I don't know if it's Danish, or, but it's, it's, it's a very beautiful uh, city that every year has a huge tulip festival, and it has a very, very unique flavor to it. The architecture and everything is just lovely. And so recently, you've had uh, people from the Hispanic community move in, and – they, no one stopped them from moving in. They have their restaurants. They, they, they're doing whatever they want to do. But then they jump up and say, Holland is racist. And the reason why they ended up saying that it's racist is because Holland, I guess, and this is what I said publicly, I said, I guess because when they came in the town, they didn't hear. It has its own unique flavor. Holland is Holland. Holland is what it is. That's why people come from all over the world to see the Tulip Festival every spring. It is not Little Mexico. It is not supposed to be that. That's not what it is. They moved into Holland and want to change Holland into something that reflects the Spanish culture. And because it is not, they've been running around saying, well, Holland is racist. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. Well, it's a very prosperous community, and, 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 and they've come, and the Hispanics have moved there and are prospering themselves. And I can tell you that the government promotes this kind of stuff, this kind of fake division, just to cause discourse. And, and, and um, so it, was, it, is, it had gotten so bad that they had asked me to write a column about it because you know they're running around saying how racist it was. And when I was in Holland, it was one of the nicest places that I had ever visited in Michigan since I've been here. The people are friendly, and they have to be anyway because it's a, it's, it's a tourist town. And so I was met with nothing but manners and well-treatment. And I am not going to a place, a special place like Holland, expecting it to, let's say, be a Cleveland. I mean <laughs> – I mean, that's where I'm from, and I'm not going to run around and say, well, because you're not like Cleveland, you're racist. I mean, it, it, it is so asinine how brainwashed people are in this country, thanks but no thanks to the government school system. And what Cool Mike was talking about when he talked about the school system and the problems that blacks have at home, well, guess what? The root of the problems that 
blacks have today in the home can be traced all the way back to the government because before government got fully involved through the, the, the – what they, and they used what my dad called the bastardized rights movement. You know, The world called it civil rights, but my dad called it bastardized rights, and I would ask him, what do you mean? He, he would tell me. He says, look, they were not standing on unalienable rights, and they're going to use civil rights – in all kinds of ways. I don't know how he had the vision to see way in the future. And he says, but they're going to be using it in all kinds of ways. That you're, as a, as When you become an adult, Ron, you're going to see some horrible things. This group will be pitted against that black, this group, that group, and all kinds of things. And they will be all running on civil rights, alienable rights of the individual that come from God and which should not be changed or switched or, or around. Meaning, that I can walk around and be who I am and who I choose to be, but I am, do not have the right to walk into Curtis's space or anyone else's space and to change them and how they are or to change their community or to change how they think. Unless, of course, I, I see Curtis on something that is self-destructive. Yeah, I'd intervene and say, hey, man, this is detrimental to your life. But I'm talking about as far as General destructive behavior, which was propagated by the government schools it, it, and, and the civil rights movement, because before the civil rights movement, the black community was improving every decade economically and in every other way. They didn't have the problems of today. Um, in fact, the out of wedlock baby birth rate in the black community was lower than the general white population, and the white population rate was great. And so if you went to most black neighborhoods, I've seen the pictures, even in Det Detroit. They were, the streets were lined with businesses. The homes were clean. The dads were at home. They weren't running around like, like they were, are today, running wallowing in self-pity and, and self-hatred and taking it out on their, on, on their fellow blacks. Why? Because up to that point… Like every other nationality in America that blended into America, they passed down the proper principles, most of which were Christian based to their to their to their to their children, and so on and so on and so on. Either you got a job or open a business that would be your goal to either open a job open a business or get a job, go to college that that was it. But 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 they allowed the government schools starting way back, but it didn't work until they got the civil rights. They had to get a real big movement because there wasn't enough of the chipping away that, that the government schools had been doing ever since the early part of the of the twentieth century. It wasn't working in mass. So that when they got the bastardized rights movement, when they took it took it over, because a lot of people don't know that when Martin Luther King started, he was calling on the United States to live up to her ideals in the Constitution. But when the communists infiltrated through the wives, by the way, and took it over <clears throat> and pushed Martin Luther King in, in, in a more communistic direction, that's what opened the door to all the other crap that 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 took you know that invaded that movement. In fact. Uh, even as far as guns, most people don't know that Martin Luther King and both and Abernathy were gun carriers. But it was the communists that came to that to that movement, and they went to the wives first and said, "Well, if they really believe in peace, they'll give up their guns." Because back then, most blacks in, in the South they owned guns and they believed in it, and they had to. To stay alive so that their house wouldn't get burned down by the Democrats, cowards who would run around in sheets and burn, try to burn their houses down, or, or or the nice ones would just put crosses on their on their front lawns and burn them. So yeah, you know, I uh, uh, two quick questions for you. You you alliterated er earlier about the Moors. Who are they? You know, they recently came to one of my town halls, and someone said, "Who are the half people?" I've never seen them before, and someone said they're Moors. I don't know who they are. Secondly, keep in mind, they, uh, um, the Democrats also boycotted Abe Lincoln's uh, inauguration because yeah. he believed in something called uh, – he didn't believe in something called slavery. 
And uh, <laughs> I had some. I posted that on my Facebook, and I had progressives attacking me this morning, saying, "Well, back then Democrats were Republicans." It's like, oh, really? I know. I mean, <laughs> oh, what was that, that lie? Oh, yeah. I know. There's always something with, you know. But um, the Moors, where, where did they come from? I mean, I've lived here all my life. I've never seen them up until Tuesday's town hall. Well, the, well, the Moors that I'm familiar with from history, you can go all the way back to Europe. The Moors um, uh, invaded Europe. They were basically Muslims, and they invaded. Spain. Yeah, yes, yeah, Spain. I was going to say because if you go to Barcelona, and um, what is the other major city? Barcelona. There's another city, and you'll see the beautiful. I hate to call it beautiful, but it is Moorish architecture uh, in 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 Spain. Cordoba. And they ruled. Cord- absolutely, and they ruled there for I think. I know it was hundreds of years. Uh, it's been a while, a long time since I read about that history, but I know it was hundreds of years. And those people were uh, very dominant, very uh, – they weren't the nicest people on earth. And that's that's who the Moors are, and they, they, they were not nice. They, uh, they went up against Rome, and Rome kind of kicked their butts a little bit, but um, after Rome – that's when they built up and they eventually invaded uh, Spain and, 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 and other parts of, of, of Europe to a lesser degree. But they lasted there. I think it was, if I'm not cor- if I am correct, it was about 400 years. I, I'm, that's, that's a guess because, like I said, it's been a long time since I read that story. And um, they're brutal. they were a brutal sort, um, more so than even the, the, this, this, the, the Spanish and all of that. But uh, yeah, so they're they're around and they, uh, they they haven't given up. They 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 continue to be. I'm so happy that um, another reason why I'm very happy that Ali Obama is gone is because no more. In fact, if yesterday they were talking about how border security agents started doing their jobs again despite orders from Obama. They said, screw it, we're going to start doing our job now. And uh, there were rumors that uh, there were a lot of uh, multinational soldiers of war gathered on the border in the area of Tijuana. Um, Obviously, they haven't poured into our country or anything, but uh, like I said, that was a rumor. And, uh, you know, it it is amazing that America did survive. The way she did under the Obama, uh, 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 under the Obama regime, I had America been an average nation, I will submit to you, friends, that an, uh, the America would have gone under because no nation, no average nation, could survive. Number one, this level of debt. Number two, the level of immorality being just poured into the country through its government school system. Number three. A huge number of invaders that have been allowed into our country and special rights granted to everything evil or wrong or perverted allowed in this nation on such a grand scale. And uh, it, it is but by the grace of God that this United States of America stands today and will once again very soon um, – be the strongest nation in the in the history of of the world again, and uh, I, I believe it was because two and three years ago, and I told a good friend of mine, he's my engineer uh, at the radio station where I produce the Edwards Notebook commentaries. Ben, I would tell Ben every every week, this is three years ago. Ben, it's not over. It's not over. I know it's bad. It it looks it looks like it's over. If we were an average nation, it would be over. And he would look at me like I was crazy. You know, he's a fellow Christian. And I said, Ben, I tell you what, let's start praying together every week. When I come to the station, we're going to pray together. Because you've got to settle down, my friend. You're on the air. You've got your own show. <clears throat> and you've got to be more positive. You've got you to see what I see. So we started praying together. And lo and behold, uh, I guess he would go home and regurgitate it and pray on his own and seek God for himself. He and his wife, I said, get with your wife. Don't rely on me. Go to God. Go to his word. I'm just a messenger. And lo and behold, he started, you know, he started turning around and then 
And I think I mentioned it last in our last show when it was the Sweet 16 and Trump. I, I told Ben then, I said, Ben, Trump's got this. Oh, man, I don't know. I don't know. Look how they're going. I said, it don't matter. I said, Trump's a, a, a different kind of guy. He's more like you and I. Fit in their eye. He's, he'll fight. He's a fighter. And that's going to resonate with just enough people. He said, well, what about the church? You've been talking about how the church is, 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 so, is so weak and so inept. Yes, that's true, Ben. I said, but there's always a remnant. I said, remember, we've talked about this. It was never, ever more than 13% of the population that was in favor of us fighting against Great Britain for our, the freedom of our nation. I said, don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about them. If they freak you out, don't look at them. Just look to him, the one who shed his grace upon on America, the one who protected General Washington when he was shot clean with, with, with bullets, but yet he remained unharmed. But the hole is in that jacket. I said, so don't worry about it. God's got this. I said, all we have to do is maintain our faith. All we have to do is maintain what we're doing. We have to tell the truth. We're the truth tellers. Don't worry about what NBC is doing. Don't worry about what CNN is doing. Let's be concerned about what we're doing. We're going to be the new majority in the media. We've got people all over the place. When you think that you're the only one, look in the Bible and the story. I think this is the story of Jeremiah where he thought he was the only one. And God said, wait a minute. Oh, you little idiot. I've got 7,000 men who are just like you, who are believers just like you throughout this, 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 this land. Don't worry about it. And lo and behold, I started getting more communications. And millions, literally millions and millions of, of people of, of, of the Christian faith had been praying for this country in pockets all over this country. And there was a national call where people were praying together in myth. In mass, my wife and I were a part of it, 100,000 people every single morning on the free conference call. And now it goes on, but it's broken down where each state has its own prayer every morning for the country. My wife runs Michigan. And so <clears throat> it goes on. The fight has just begun, but this is a fight we're going to win because – God wanted this. God, you know, you know, God is 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 very symbolic. In in 2013, we got a word that there's going to be a trumpet. God's going to use a, a man called, you know, he's a trumpet. Well, lo and behold, next thing you know, 2015, down the escalator comes calls comes a man named Trump. That's the guy, and we knew it. I just knew it. And um, here we are. He's in, and we're going to win. It's going to be fun. I'm, I'm going to have a good time watching this unveiling of, of the resurgence of our republic. We're going to see a dropping of barriers between people. The authentic, the authentic Americans are going to all be coming together across in racial lines across this country, and we're going to be working to rebuild America the beautiful. And you're going to see resurgence in our cities. They will once again be uh, models of civility, as American cities were in the 1950s. And European newspapers in the 50s used to look at American cities as models of, of beauty and civility. And that's going to happen again. And those areas or those people that do not want a part of this, they want to remain socialist pigs, you know, they have a right to be that way. But you know what? They're not going to be the influence anymore. Their influence and power is draining, draining away. Because God is not through with this country. But believe it or not, at her weakest point during the middle of the reign of Obama, the United States of America was putting out 75% of the gospel. I think I mentioned this on the other show, but it bears repeating. There are so many reasons, positive reasons, that we have to rejoice about the resurgence of America. Our schools are going to be turned around because parents are going to be – they're going to be like in the movie network. We, we're, we're mad as hell, and we're not going to take this anymore. 
But when, rather than being mad, we're going to be happy warriors. And there's a big difference. It's better. You're more victorious if you go in the ring with a smile on your face than frowned up and, and, and mad. Because when you're mad and you're torn up inside, that eats up on your own body when you have bitterness within. But if we project a happiness and a joy, we will be like hot knives going cutting through butter. And, th- and all this progressivism and all this madness is going to become so minute in their ability to influence our society. And those of us, black, white, whatever, we're just going to have a good time rebuilding this nation. Tr- Trump is right. You know, I've, 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 I have felt about this nation – those things even before Trump came on the horizon I, because I felt that America, there's no choice because I knew China wasn't going to be a blessing in the world. I knew uh, 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 Russia is not going to be a, bl- a blessing in the world because they're not even – they don't even have manufacturing of any consequence in Russia. It, 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 it's on America, you, me, and the rest of us, and so – I, I just implore you guys, everyone, to, to, to just thank God and be happy and, and um, put, you know, just roll up our sleeves together and do what we know to do in our spheres, in our metrons, and we will be very happy with the results because America is worth fighting for. The principles that made this country great, I mean, you have – we owe it to our history. Great men like Benjamin Rush or Frederick Douglass or in our time, Ronald Reagan. We can't let, we can't let these people, all that work they put into our republic and into, into fighting for liberty, we can't allow that to just go up and smoke and die on our – not on our watch. So I'm sorry I just went on and on and on, but uh, I, I'm so excited that's that's what you're hearing. Just an excitement about that was what beautiful. Oh, that was beautiful. Uh, Thank you. I, just... I mean, that's, you know, we're we're. I think we're we all feel that way. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I think that his speech clearly indicated he's not said a lot since he's won. And the speech basically said, batter up. And I, <laughs> I, I, I clearly think right now, I think during that speech, uh, I, I clearly, you, you can feel the mood is changing. And I also think with this speech, it sent a message to people like McCain, Lindsey Graham, and many others. You've become irrelevant. Um, and, well, and, and, and I think that, I think this is the case is that, America is moving, whether you like it or you don't like it. This is the direction we're going. And clearly, you had mentioned the Border Patrol agents. I mean, if you really think about it, basically, (laughs) they're ignoring orders from the president. And basically, they're basically saying, you know, uh, Trump is our leader now. Done. I mean, obviously, uh, he had not been sworn in, but... you know, I don't know how to – what you just said was just beautiful. It just really said it's the best. And here in Michigan, we need to do it now because clearly um, our governor is very progressive, although he's a Republican. The lieutenant governor is beyond. He, he spoke today at our gathering in Kent County. He's just – he's so far to the left. He, this, this guy would make Karl Marx look like a, uh, look like a conservative. <laughs> But I mean, what do you clearly we need to drain the swamp. And I, here's, a, here's a interesting for, for Diane and Curtis. Um, you heard our guest mention now, this is two shows where he mentioned Jim Chiodo. Jim does a lot of posts. Jim's just like me. He's an activist. He posted something that was really uh, factual on Facebook. And everyone started calling him Fat Jim and said, like, oh, you missed a comma or something. They didn't address the issue that he posted, which was very factual. And I think he, his comment was, it is a constitutional duty of the president 
to protect the states of America from invasion. And which is true. We are being invaded um, by illegals. And, but this is how they do it. They start name calling you. They start nitpicking. You know, that's how they do it. That's how they roll. Absolutely. What do you think of Bill's shooting? Okay. Question, what was that? I'm sorry, I missed the question. What, what, what do you think of Bill's shooting? Well, I'll tell you, I like Mr. Shooty as a person. He needs to stand up and be more of a more of a trumper. I like his views, and I I think I, I right now as Attorney General, Bill Shooty's our Attorney General. For those who don't know, he's still bordering on that line of candidate. Um, and I don't want to offend this group, or I don't want to offend that group. Um, but I like where he stands, and I like the fact that he's taken on. Um, you know, he's taken on uh, the federal government. Uh, that's important when it comes to states' rights. Um, I, I, I just wish Bill would be more of a conservative Republican and stand up and say, this is what I'm doing. Um, I've been with him since his inception. I campaigned for him. Um, and I'd like to see him run for governor. But I only can do it if he – he doesn't have to be Donald Trump. But he has to at least believe in the Trump principles which is our Constitution, um, and be ready to fight for him. Um, because Donald Trump said something that Donald Trump today, and I think everybody, when he said, today I give the power back to the people. I mean, what must the progressive career politicians at all levels, local, what must they have been thinking? I mean, he basically said, I'm stripping power from all of you. And it's now back in the hands of the people. I don't think we've ever seen that. Bill Shooty needs to be more like that. Yeah, I, um, Mr. Shooty, <clears throat> my wife and I both know him personally. In fact, she's even have, has prayed for him for his hip pro- medical problems and stuff. And he really disappointed me on one particular issue. Remember when they had the um, the bathroom issue in Michigan, and uh, um. They he was supposed to stand against it, and in fact, when the Supreme Court went ahead and did what they did, there were three other attorney generals that were willing to stand with him, and they had a time period in which they could go and appeal it. Uh, Mike DeWine, DeWine of Ohio, and I forget the other ones, and, and Bill Schutte. And so I went up to see uh, Mr. Schutte. I'm sitting there, and I said, Bill, you know what the drill is. You know why I'm here. <laughs> and we we sat there about an hour going back and forth, back and forth. And he says, well, that's what the Supreme – I said, the Supreme Court's job is not, by the way, they're not supposed to be making law. Well, the Supreme Court said, excuse me, there is a time to appeal it. You have three other attorney generals who are willing to go with you and fight. Do you know he said no? He said, and he said, he told me on one hand, Ron, this goes against my Christian wow. principles. You know, you, you and I are both men of God, and, uh, and I, I disagree with this, but it, it's the law. I said, excuse me, it's an ill-contrived law. Court has no business in making law. Do you, do you get it? Earth to, earth to shooting. And he says, Ron, I understand. There's nothing I can do. I said, there is something you can do. I said, why not? Get out of the office, get some fresh air, and go and appeal this thing with the other gentlemen that are willing to do this with you. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. This is the Constitution is what it is. It is what it is, and so is our state constitution. Each state, of course, has their own uh, state constitution, but states' rights. But the attorney general needs to go abide by the Constitution, period. And, of course, when he said, you know, I can't do it, well, obviously, he, he was a little bit more concerned with public opinion. And you can't be. You know, I, I think if we really added up history, the elected officials that survived the most really didn't go by polls or public opinion. I mean, they just they 
abided by a constitution or the writ, and they went by it, and they held firm to it, and in the end, they usually are the ones who are successful. I just, I just, I think in Michigan, what happened is, um, with the open primaries where anyone can vote, Democrats flood into the GOP um, primaries. They elect the most liberal. This way, they have a great option. If their candidate doesn't win, they still get a liberal progressive. And we need to close that. Um, in Michigan, the Republican Secretary of State, um, the uh, Supreme Court nominees, um, the Lieutenant Governor, many are they're picked by the party, by the precinct delegates. And that's what we need to do. The precinct delegates need to pick the candidates and close it, close it off to invasion. Um, I just think we're off to a great start. I think now at the federal level, I, today's speech was just unprecedented. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, just when you think Donald Trump cannot make any more enemies, today he did. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, you know, You know, you're right, Mike. Um, I think one of the reasons why we still have to deal with the likes of McCain, Lindsey Graham, is because um, Arizona and South Carolina have, have um, you know, open elections. So anybody can vote from the party line. So it's hard and difficult, very difficult to get rid of people like that. But we, we have to do something. Those states have to um, insist on making a change. They have to. And, 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 you know, Curtis, you are a veteran. We honor you for that. But does that mean we can't disagree with John McCain? I mean, well, he's a, he's a veteran. John McCain, made, yeah, I understand, and I and I admire him for it. I am indebted to him for it. But if that means does that mean if he says this guy is blue, cool, Mike just has to agree with him or shut up because the fact that I, I just I think that's insulting. It's almost like saying you know uh, I I don't know it, it just I, I think it is rather insulting that um, well, you know they use the that as a problem with, uh, for his liberalism. It's the same thing with uh, Congressman um, Lewis. You know, he's, he's done uh, some great things back in the day in the civil rights era, but he's been riding that wave, you know, for the last um, four decades and haven't really done anything for the black community. And you know what? I, 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 I think that um, today's speech... Um, just given the fact, I don't know if uh, anyone was watching NPR. The minute the minute um, um, President Trump got like he did, I went right to NPR, and I mean the, the, their panel are like ninety-year-old hippie burnouts. And when they went back to the studio, these people were just like, uh, I mean, they were totally in shock. You know, dead airtime before they said, uh, "I think we need to go to a station break." Thinking, yeah, I mean, they, they just, they couldn't believe it kept coming. He didn't just, you know, say one thing they disagree with, or to, he just kept shooting and attacking and attacking and attacking. And uh, progressives just don't know how to handle somebody like him. And uh, they played a clip. This clip was of, uh, of many of the things President Trump said during the campaign some funny things, some insults of people, and going on and on. In the ending of this video, it was, uh, he said something about lying Tad and uh, dishonest, I forgot what Hillary's nickname was, but then he just says things, and then at the end of this clip, he said, yeah, little Marco made this comment. He goes, and now I got Pocahontas up my ass, which was Jennifer Warren. They don't know how to handle that. They just can't handle that I, I mean so you go back and these, these people are mesmerized it's like they're just looking thinking like what is going on well when they went back I, it wasn't CNN one of the cable networks he, someone said what just happened and the one person said whatever it is they didn't teach it in law school I mean Trump has just <laughs> thrown these people right, right, right out of the bus and they just don't know how to react to this they they just thought, you know, they, every now and then here comes a Republican, they'll weigh it out and, 
in time they'll get their liberal Republican or their Democrat. But it's not. I have, and I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but uh, in preparation is already several mergers. Um, he's going to reduce several departments, which they eventually think will be weaned out. But it's already a ten trillion dollar reduction, one trillion dollars a year for the next ten years on these departments. So I mean that already in itself be waiting in the wings for tomorrow or sometime this week. He might be a little hungover tonight, but um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. people don't know how to react to this. We can't cut the federal government. Well, why? Well, you just can't. Yes, it's coming. Well, Mike, I, I want to I want to expound on something you said about why they can't get over these these, these emotions of theirs um, because of what happened in the elections. Um, Democrat Party. They, they've been masters at reaching out to the constituency on an emotional level. So everything's basically emotionally based, you know. And and when you see the outcome of the elections, that's why we see an outpouring of emotions, I believe, because basically everything on the left is emotionally driven, you know, emotion driven. So. I think that's why we've seen all the uh, tantrums and the violence and everything because they don't they don't react like like mature adults. You know, they act more like little sport, little children or brats that cannot have their way. And as you know, children are emotional. So these folks they need to grow up. This is a constitutional republic. We are in the habit of um, switching out the president. And we've been doing it since the beginning of this country, you know, the founding of this country. So, you know, I I, I just don't see it ever changes, changing with them, you know, their reaction on an emotional level. But I do see that party shrinking and having less influence in the future if we play our cards right. Well, I, I think I the, the Congress people, real quick, the Congress people who stood out, who, who didn't attend, I think they've become – Moot. They they're almost now. Other than a vote, they're they're really irrelevant. But I I was very happy as a person who works in the inner city, as a person who feels it's a moral obligation. Um, he addressed the problems in the inner city. This has never been touched by any politician. They it's too it's too much of a hot potato. But he acknowledged the failure. That in itself, right there, just again. A absolute step that – let's go back 100 years. You've never heard a politician say what he said and touch the topic that simply – they teeter-totter your political career. He doesn't care. He's not a politician. He's a patriot. Anyway, sorry. I know I interrupted, but I didn't mean that. Yeah, I oh, no, that's that. fine. Just to let you know that uh, we are ready to uh, wind down the show. Uh, oh, we wow. are down to the last four moments, and believe me, gentlemen, this went way too fast. Oh, cool, Mike. You are absolutely cool. And it is always a pleasure to speak with you, Ron. And uh, thank you to Ryan for calling in as well. And I'll let Curtis to, uh, start closing this out, and I will uh, follow up with the closing. God bless you, yeah, God yeah. bless you. I just want to say that... Um, you know, when was the last time when Republicans lost that we rioted and we overturned cars and 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 you know did all kind of deplorable things? You know, <laughs> when was the last time you read about something like that? I don't ever remember reading anything like that. So the, the, that just goes to show, you know, the differences between the two, you know, ideologies here. You know, one. With that's more cerebral in its approach to um, life and reality, another one that's more emotional based. You know, and and Curtis. Kind of huh. Yes, and Curtis. You know the Democrats, their history. That's their history. I mean, when the blacks were freed, the the Democrats rioted, to, and, and well, they became oh, violent yeah. then. After Reconstruction and all of that, they didn't want blacks to uh, to advance or to achieve anything in life. Uh, it was Democrats that uh, bombed 
uh, blacks from the air with a crop duster out in Oklahoma, where bl- where yeah. blacks were living very successful lives because they were segregated uh, at the choice of the white Democrats, and they said fine, and so they prospered more than the whites around them because they found oil on their property, and so um, what happens? The jealous Democrats who said well. They're happy on being left alone, and they're prospering too. Uh, we can't have this. So what do they do? They used a crop duster, and they bombed them from the air. Until until uh, 9-11, that had been the only place that had been bombed from the air on U.S. soil by Democrats. And that, so Democrats have a history of being unruly, uncouth, uncivilized brutes whenever they don't get their way. They've always been a progressive uh, immoral bunch that, uh, as you said, uh, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing you. They're just basically squandered their their own existence into nothing more than irrelevancy, and that's all yeah. fine with me. All right, Cal, I turn it over to you for the final closing. No, just to say that it has been once again another fascinating program, and uh, we thank you all for joining. The Southern Sense. Your host, Annie, is partying it up there <laughs> in Washington, D.C. And so Curtis and I, uh, we had our fun in Annie's hen house. So, Curtis, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to sit with you. Hey, I thank you. And um, next time I'll make sure my mic is hot before I try to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And I do look forward to speaking with uh, Cool Mike and Ron um, again very soon. But ladies and gentlemen, we are going to uh, continue the uh, celebrations. It is Donald Trump Day. It is a wondrous day in America. So we thank you all so very much for being here. And we bid you a wonderful good evening. Good night, Ron. Good night, Mike. And good night, Curtis. Good night, all. weekend, everyone. God Enjoy the bless weekend. America. Celebrate. Absolutely. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Come and join the fight.